The fourth wrong view is do evangelism, not politics. And this sort of comes to the heart of what uh, this meeting was announced to talk about tonight. Does doing politics distract from the gospel? And some people say yes. They say the church's task is evangelism and not political involvement. And they will say getting involved in trying to influence government and laws does no spiritual good. My response to that is first, that the gospel, yes, is good news, but the good news of the gospel includes the entire teaching of the Bible. Yes, the heart of the message of the gospel is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The heart of the teaching of the gospel is by grace you have been saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The heart of the gospel is the forgiveness of sins and personal transformation, but that's not the only message of the Bible. Jesus was looking not just for people whose sins were forgiven, but Jesus was looking for transformed lives and through them a transformed world. 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And Jesus came announcing the good news of the kingdom of God. And as the kingdom of God began to advance, it began to show that the reign and rule of God and the power of God was present in, G in people's hearts and lives. And that means a lot of things began to change. The gospel fully understood <clears throat> results first in transformed lives, but second, Jesus wants that to result in transformed families and transformed neighborhoods and transformed schools and transformed businesses and transformed societies and surely also transformed governments. You see, the reason for that is that God leaves us here on earth once we've trusted in Christ as Savior. He leaves us here on earth not just to do evangelism, but also to do good for other people. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We are to do good works. We are to be kind to our neighbor and show compassion to those in need and help those in distress. That's part of what God leaves us on the earth to do to do evangelism and to do good works. In fact, when Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, the very next verse, Ephesians 2, 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God left us on the earth in order that we should glorify God by doing good for others. And so, doesn't that include seeking good laws that will help our neighbors, that will protect our neighbors' marriage, that will protect our neighbors' children, and that will protect the moral values of our, of our neighbors as their children and they are growing up, that will protect people's freedom to be obedient to God and follow Him in paths that they understand. If someone said to me, Wayne, why have you spent two years of your life just now writing a book on politics according to the Bible? And why did you come for an entire week to speak in six different cities in England on why Christians should seek to influence politics and government? If I have only one sentence to answer, I will say, because I'm seeking to obey Jesus' command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It really is that as I understand my own heart. I seek the good of my neighbor immediately and my neighbors throughout my nation and my neighbors throughout the United Kingdom. And when I seek the good of my neighbor and seek to love my neighbor as myself, I want good laws and good government for people. People say, oh, does it make any difference, really? I mean, what does it matter what kinds of laws we have? Let me propose to you two examples that show the extremes of a nation that allows freedom and good laws, not perfect, but good, and a nation made up the very same kind of people that has 
oppressive and harmful and evil laws. Think of North and South Korea. Think of North Korea, an incredibly oppressive, evil government in which millions have died of starvation. And I know there are a few secret Christians in North Korea, but I also know that thousands of people have been born, grown up, lived, and died in North Korea without ever having had opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know that there are no North Korean missionary societies sending missions any place in the world. The government certainly wouldn't allow it. And then think of South Korea. The church has experienced remarkable revival there, tremendous freedom because of laws that allow people freedom to preach the gospel and to hear it and to trust in Christ. And the church has had explosive growth in South Korea, and South Korea is sending missionaries throughout the world. Does it make a difference what kind of laws people have? It surely does. And between those two extremes, there are all sorts of gradations of good or bad laws, laws in governments that allow freedom to serve God rightly or that are oppressive and take away people's freedoms a bit at a time. Paul says, as we have opportunity, let us do good for everyone, and especially those of the household of faith, Galatians 6.10. And I think the work of the Christian Institute here in the United Kingdom, Christian Institute, is doing that. It's doing good for everyone, especially those of the household of faith. That's what Galatians 6.10 tells us to do. So God leaves us on the earth to do both evangelism and to spend our time doing good for other people. In fact, throughout the history of the church, Christians have used their influence to try to bring about good laws in various nations of the earth. Let me read you a list. It was through the influence of Christians that the Roman Empire outlawed infanticide putting to death of infants, outlawed child abandonment, and outlawed abortion in the Roman Empire, 374 AD. Through Christian influence, the gladiatorial contests in Rome, in which one of the contestants died, were outlawed in 404 AD. Christian influence led in various governments to granting property rights and other protections to women. Christian influence led to a law in India that prohibited the burning of widows alive with their dead husbands, 1829. Christian influence led to outlawing the binding of young women's feet in China, 1912. Christian influence led to opposing and often abolishing slavery in the Roman Empire, in Ireland, in the British Empire, through most of Europe, and in the United States. Just this afternoon, Alexander, my son, who is with me this week, and I walked through St. John's College Chapel in Cambridge, and we saw there the picture of William Wilberforce holding a Bible labored through his whole life as a member of parliament, sometimes a very lonely battle in the early 1800s to win the passage of a law first outlawing the slave trade in the British Empire and then outlawing slavery altogether. William Wilberforce did that as a Bible-believing, committed Christian. And then following on that campaign of William Wilberforce, in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s in the United States, there was a strong abolitionist movement working for the abolition of slavery in the United States. Where did that come from? In the mid-1830s, more than two-thirds of the abolitionists in the United States were Christian clergymen preaching politics from the pulpit. That is, preaching that slavery was morally wrong and the laws should be changed and slavery should be abolished. And then in the 1960s, in the United States, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., a Baptist pastor, 
preached from the Bible to lead the campaign to outlaw segregation and discrimination based on race in the United States. A Baptist pastor bringing influence to change the laws of a nation for good. So again and again, these changes happen throughout history because Christians realized that if they could influence laws and governments for good, they would be obeying Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. If they could influence laws and politics for good, they would be obeying Matthew 22, 39. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But when I say this, people raise some objections. For one thing, sometimes people say, oh, that sounds idealistic, Wayne, but you know what? It won't do any good because I think we're living in the end times and I think persecution is coming. Doesn't it say in Matthew 24 that a time of great tribulation is coming on the earth? And so if you think we can change society for good, you're wrong. It's doomed to failure. Persecution is coming. Well, my response to that is to say, I agree that Matthew 24 says that before Christ returns, there is going to be a time of great persecution on the church. But I don't know when that's going to happen. It might happen in a year, it might happen in 10 years, but it might happen 100 years or 300 years from now. Who knows? We don't know the time of Christ's return. What we do know is that we are to live in obedience to the word of God until Christ returns. And persecution might come, but how do you know that revival isn't coming? In fact, revival might be coming. In fact, in my heart, for 20 years or more, there's been an expectation that revival is yet to come. Great revival sweeping across the United States, sweeping across England and Europe. Why? And one reason I think that is I look at the studies of statistics that talk about what has happened around the world since 1950. If you look at statistics on the percentage of born-again Christians who read their Bible daily and pray, which is kind of a statistical test of who is genuinely a believer, it was about 3% in 1950. Then it went to 4%. Then to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now about 12% of the population of the world, Bible-believing Christians. That kind of growth in the church has never before happened in the history of the world. And it's happened during the last 60 years. Where? Three places. Africa, Asia, Latin America. Who does that leave out? Europe and North America and Australia. And so I, I think, I don't, I don't know. I don't know God's plans for history. But I think, will God bring revival to all these other countries of the world and pass by this nation? And passed by Britain that has given such benefit and done such good for the world throughout history. Passed by Britain that has sent missionaries to all of those countries that are now seeing revival. Passed by Britain that has stood, stood firm for the truths of the Reformation. And where people gave their lives to preserve the truth of the gospel and translate the Bible into English. Will God pass by this nation and my nation? I hope not. I don't think so. I don't know. But I expect revival is yet coming. And you know, if revival does come, the work of organizations like the Christian Institute and other parachurch organizations that influence laws and politics for good, the work of that 
kind of organization will be to create and protect the legal space in which revival can happen and growth of the church can take place, in which churches will get permission from cities to build buildings and buy buildings and have worship centers in buildings rather than being denied that permission all the time. It will give the legal space in which people will have the freedom to go out on the street and read the Bible without being arrested or preach the gospel without being arrested. It will give the freedom for churches to say, well, we're just going to hire Christians on our staff rather than being brought, have a lawsuit brought against them to force them to hire atheists and non-Christians and people antagonistic to the gospel. And again and again, in hundreds of ways, those who seek to influence laws and governments for good will, I think, provide the space that will give the legal protection under the civil government established by God that will give freedom and space for revival to occur and to prosper. So it's extremely important. There is much spiritual consequence that comes from law and politics and government. But when I say that, then people come back, at least in their minds, and occasionally people have said this to me. Well, wouldn't a little persecution be good for us? In fact, shouldn't we just secretly at least pray that God would bring persecution to the church to kind of purify the church and get sort of those lazy marginal Christians out of our church seats and things like that. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but, but, but I, mean, I mean, people think that and they wonder that. My answer is that Jesus responded to that question when he taught his disciples how to pray. He said in Matthew 6, 13, we are to pray lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. See, we are not to pray for persecution. If it comes, then we trust God and we seek him for strength to be faithful in spite of the persecution. But we should never seek persecution any more than we should pray, God, please give me a physical sickness to purify me or something like that. No, we we shouldn't seek evil to come upon us. If it comes, we trust God for it, but we should pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And Paul, when he tells believers how they should pray for civil government, he says in in 1 Timothy 2, he says this, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions. Now he's going to tell us how we should pray for government. That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul is saying, pray that you have good government so you can live a peaceful and quiet life, so you not be harassed or persecuted by the government. It's good, and it's, it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. And then he says, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. I think he is implying that when we have good government, it gives space for the gospel to spread and prosper. So no, we shouldn't seek persecution. But then people say, I'm still worried. I'm still worried, Wayne. I think political involvement is going to distract us from the main task of preaching the gospel. And there, I want to say, God calls different people to different tasks. Billy Graham, I think God called Billy Graham clearly to the task of evangelism. And Billy Graham, throughout his life, refused to take a stand on political issues. He said, I just want to focus on the pure gospel and not get involved in politics, and I want to have access to people in both political parties. And I think God called him to that. But you know what? I think God called William Wilberforce to be involved intensely in politics as a member of parliament here in the United Kingdom in order to bring Christian influence to bear. And he did that as a a professing Christian. Doesn't God have enough people in the world that he can call different people to different tasks? Doesn't 1 Corinthians 12 tell us that the church consists of many parts but one body? And can't we bless the work of some who are called to evangelism, some who are called simply to work on the sound system so that, it, so that you can hear me tonight. Some to work on setting up the room so it's clean and, and, and comfortable to sit in. And some to lead us in worship and, and write worship songs like Stuart. Doesn't God call us to different tasks? 
And doesn't God call some people to devote most of their time and their effort as Christians to working in the business community to bring Christian influence? And doesn't call some people, doesn't he call some people to work in the educational system to bring Christian influence to bear there? And doesn't he call some to work in the political realm? So I don't think we need to worry that it'll distract us from the overall task of preaching the gospel when God calls different people to different tasks. But the overall task of the church, the overall task of the church, I think, should include both the preaching of evangelism and influence on politics. And I think we should encourage one another in these callings. So if you see somebody else that God calls to work on the sound system, say thank you. And if you see somebody else that God calls to work on keeping the building clean, say thank you. And if you see Colin Hart and his staff working on trying to bring good influence on government, say thank you and pray for them and bless them. We can encourage one another in different callings. So the fourth wrong view is, do evangelism, not politics. I think we should do both.